Today with Joseph Prince. How do we, we become righteous? Not by doing righteous. We receive His righteousness. And then we walk away and God treats us like Jesus. Just like God treats Jesus on the cross like us. The sinner that we are. And all this is the love plan of God. Sin is not the problem today. It is the lack of revelation. God cannot say, boys will be boys, never mind. Let's sweep everything under the carpet. You know, God cannot do that. Neither can the judge here in our Supreme Court. He cannot be the, saying, oh, you're my son, you know, my son and my, oh, my dear son, you're right here in front of me. What do you do? Ah, never mind. Sweep everything under the carpet. I forgive you. No, that's not a just judge. And God is a perfect and just God. God is love, all right? But justice, the Bible says justice and righteousness is the foundation of His throne. The whole universe works because God is a God of His Word, all right? We exaggerate, God doesn't, amen. So God says to Adam, before he sinned, God says, dying, you shall die. In the Hebrew, it is two words of dying. Dying, you shall die. You will start to die, where? Spiritually. Spiritually, where you are made in the image of God, you are cut off from God. And that's why man either live in his body, all right, live after the lust of his flesh, live for the indulgence, a hedonistic lifestyle of pursuit of pleasure, indulgence, drinking, you know, uh, uh, carousing, and all kinds of things. Or he live after his mind until I'm so smart, I can create AI. And AI can talk to me, I talk back to AI. All right, either he live in his body or he live in his mind, but he no more live in his spirit. When you talk about the spirit, he doesn't understand because the spirit, is the, the real him is dead. So God said to Adam, the day you partake of it, dying spiritually, you shall die one day physically. So Adam didn't die immediately, physically, but he started to die. He died in his spirit, then he died in his soul, and then he, finally he died in his body, and hence everyone dies. It's not God's plan. Never was His plan. But God told man, if you take the other, the other side, all right, the other side, we call it sin today, amen? You go by the other way, it's death. Death is the result. God warned man, amen? But the Bible says, God so loved the world. Now we come back to the story of the religious leader who came to Jesus at night and Jesus said to him, you must be born again. But in the same night, Jesus looked at him and Jesus says, Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son referring to himself, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then he says this. Now, many people know this verse, right? We, we see this verse, especially during our football tournaments and all that you see at the site, someone hangs John 3, 16. You do not know it, you better know it by now. Amen. It's a message of God's love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Didn't he give the best angel? Amen. Didn't give another, just another human being. He gave His own Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That life that Jesus says, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But before Jesus said that, actually, by the way, this is my son's uh, memory verse, my 10-year-old son, memory verse, last two weeks. John 10.10, 10, he will tell you, the thief does not come, but to steal. Who's the thief? The devil. He comes to steal, kill, destroy. Every time you are stolen from, every time your peace is stolen from, your joy is stolen from, your relationships are stolen from, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what the devil does. He hates you because you are made in the image of God. Just like a lover that has been spurned by the one he loves. You know, uh, uh, what he, does he do? He takes the, the photo of that girl or, or, or uh, the lady. He takes the photo of the man and they will crush it. They'll crush it. They're not killing, killing the man. They're killing the photo. You know what I'm saying? Because the photo is the image of that person. So the devil can get to God. You are created in God's image. He comes against you. So he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus said. But Jesus says, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. It does not consist on the material things that you possess. You know, the one that possesses the most wins. No. There are many, many people, poor people who have plenty of possessions in the world. No. It is a person filled with love, joy, and peace that Jesus says the kingdom of God inside you manifests like this, righteousness, peace, and joy 
in the Holy Spirit. And that spills over into your relationships. When you are full of love, joy, and peace, it helps in your, and prospers your relationships, whether it's with your spouse, whether it's your children, whether it's with your colleagues and people around you. And, and it will prosper in every way. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's the greatest prosperity you can have. Joseph Princess has really helped us to, to understand that the grace of God's not too good to be true. It's just a total freeing message. Uh, God wants us to be free so we can spread His gospel and be bold with it and know who we are in Christ. Just thank you so much for everything you've done for our family's lives and we know that He's changing millions and millions of lives around the world. If the gospel of grace has impacted your life, I would like to invite you to join us as a Grace Legacy Builder. Let's advance the gospel of grace together. Visit the link on your screen to be part of leaving a legacy of grace today. Uh, even those who win the lucky draw, you know, lottery and all that, they're happy for a while. They're happy, they are, they are happy, and then they, they are shocked, and then they're surprised, and then they're happy again, and then they're scared, they'll lose, you know, and they'll, they'll be a target of, uh, of, of, of conniving relatives, and all of a sudden they have relatives, they don't realize they have relatives, you know, and uh, there's a money is relative, more money, more relatives. <laughs> anyway, and then, and then they, they are happy for a while and then uh, they realize that uh, their, their life has changed and all that. And many, many studies have shown that people who win, uh, like a sudden windfall, right? Uh, like lotteries and all that. Sooner or later, they, they lose what they have. Many of them have very sad endings. Those who pursue fame, fortune, why is it that we see this happening and no one talks about it? We see rock and roll stars and superstars and, you know, we see people like, and so many, so many have ended up, you know, dead, too young, too early, too fast. And no one wants to talk about it. Why is it that doesn't bring that kind of happiness? Why is it that they, they need another fix, a higher fix? Nobody gets too much heaven no more. It's much harder to climb by. <clears throat> ah. Much harder. Why is it so? Because friend, you don't have to reach that high. Heaven came down to be where you are. Jesus came down. We can never reach heaven. Amen. So Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I mean, when Jesus rose from the dead, He rose bodily. And that tells us that God's plan is for us spirit, soul, and body. So now we are saved. That means once you are saved, you are saved forever. Amen. You are born again. You put your trust in Christ. Now, why, why is there a need for the cross? If there are other ways to God, Jesus' death, and I say this reverently, is the most stupid thing that could be. Why go through all that suffering? I mean, we sanitize, even when we do the, a movie on Jesus, we sanitize the closest to the Passion of the Christ that, that uh, Mel Gibson did. But even then, we don't, the Bible tells us that even his bones stared at him. It was horrible. Why go through all that suffering if there are other ways to God? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to the Father but by me. And why, why must he suffer at the cross? Because friend, someone needs to pay for our sins. Therefore on that cross, he who never sinned, he did no sin, he knew no sin, in him is no sin, but he became sin for us on the cross by choice, by choice. No one could arrest him. In the garden when they came to arrest him, soldiers, strong soldiers brandishing their staves and their swords, they came to arrest Jesus, one man, came to arrest one man, amen, and the man spoke up when he asked, when they asked, we seek Jesus of Nazareth, he stepped up and says, I am. I am is the declaration of the God of, of the burning bush. Many years ago, when God chose uh, Moses to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt, and Moses asked God, when they asked me your name, what is your name, God, that I may tell them? God says, I am that I am. When Jesus came and they want to arrest him, they came up to arrest him, Jesus stepped up and says, I am. You know what happened to them? They all fell. The so-called divine captive waited for them to get up to captivate him. Who is the real captive here? 
and who is the real captivator. But he chose to lay down his life. Jesus said it like this, you know, we think that he was murdered, he was killed. No, no, no. He says, no one can take my life from me. I lay down my life. Amen. And why did he lay down his life? Why did he lay down on the cross? Why did he cry, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Because the picture of the Old Testament, the feast of Passover, is a feast to commemorate their coming out, their deliverance from Egypt, from, from slavery into freedom. And on that first Passover, God told them, put the blood on the doorposts and on the lintel. So imagine that, picture this with me, okay? Blood on the lintel and blood on the doorposts, the two doorposts, all right? What do you have? You have the cross. And God said this, when I see the blood on this night, I will cross over Egypt and the angel of death will be looking. And God says, when I see the blood, I will cause the destroyer to pass over your house. That's why I call it Passover, the feast of Passover. And God says, I will not allow the destroyer to kill your firstborn. All right? Now, God did not say, when I see your charitable deeds, when I see your fine character, when I see your good family name, when I see your academic accomplishments, he didn't say that. He says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Amen. Is the blood on your doorpost of your heart? When I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will not allow the destroyer to enter your house. When I see the blood, you know what blood is? Which animal? It's the blood of the lamb. They were all commanded to take the blood of the lamb and put it on their doorposts and on the lintel. Why the lamb? Because in those days, after that they had a temple, they had a tabernacle and a temple to go to. When they sinned, a person who has sinned, the offerer will bring his lamb. They'll get a lamb and they'll bring, they go to the priest. The priest represents God, okay? He speaks on God's behalf. He's like the eyes of God. Now, when the offerer comes with the lamb, the priest does not look at the offerer. A lot of people think when they come to God, God is looking at me, at me, all right? But if you have Jesus in your life, God is not looking at you. God is looking at Jesus, the true lamb of God. Amen. If you're without Christ, of course, if an offerer sin, all right? The idea of offerer means you're offering, isn't it? But let's say he sin and he comes boldly to the priest and say, I've sinned and there's no payment, no substitute. The priest will have to look at him and judge him and recompense him based on the crime or the sin that he did. He's left to his own devices, right? But when he sinned, God, God told them in those days when they sinned, bring a lamb as a sin offering, bring the lamb. And the priest does not look at the offerer, he looks at the lamb. And he looks for blemishes, he looks for any disease, defect, any scurvy. A lamb that is to be offered must be without blemish. So the, the priest does not examine the man. There are still believers today who think that God is looking at them, examining them. No, God is looking at your lamb. It's not how good you are. It's how good your lamb is. And who is your lamb? If you're gonna say that, you are left to your own devices. Amen. So he brings the lamb. And then the priest commands the offerer to put his hands on the head of the lamb. I feel like illustrating this, but uh, never mind. You want me to illustrate? Okay, one of you come. Come real fast. Come real fast. Okay, Pastor Henry, you're the priest. Come. Come. You got you got somehow you got priestly a uh, crown. You got a priestly crown around your. Okay, here, yeah, yeah. here. You're the priest. You want to be the lamb? We need a lamb. A cute lamb. Okay, come. Very cute lamb. Yeah, yeah. Someone wear white is lamb. Okay, okay. Good, good, good. So, okay. You bring your lamb. Okay, priest, look at the... He examines. No blemish. The lamb has no blemish. Amen? Now, notice he does not look at him. It's obvious. 
if you have sinned, God knows why you have come. Right? So it doesn't examine him. It's obvious he has sinned. He examines how good his lamb is. Right? Then, thumbs up. Good. 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 Okay. Then he commands him, stand in front of him, to lay his hands on the lamb. Okay? On the head, you should. <laughs> it is on the head. All right? Uh, he lays his hand on the, on the lamb. What is this a picture of in those days? These are all uh, visual aids before Jesus came. God was training the children of Israel, going through all these rehearsals to, to point to the real Lamb of God that would come. And when John the Baptist saw Jesus by the rivers of Jordan, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. The, definite article, the true Lamb has come who takes away the sin of the world. So, he lays his hands. Now, two things happen when he lays his hands on the lamb. All right? You can take a picture of the... This is what happens. Okay, the priest lays his hand. Actually, we have a... You can relax. You, see? you have been redeemed. Look up here. All right. So the, the sinner lays his hand on the head. He transfers his sins. His sins go into the lamb. So by laying hands, it's a picture of identification. His sins go into the lamb. And the lamb's goodness, the lamb is without blemish. It's a perfect lamb right, goes into the, his righteousness goes into the offerer. You follow what I'm saying? Two things happen. His sins, get away. His sins go into the lamb. The lamb's righteousness, right standing, goes into him. Now, pass him the knife. All right, so the knife comes out and he kills the lamb. It's a picture of the offerer must kill the lamb, not the priest. It's a picture of your sins put Jesus on the cross. We are, all, we are all there. Our sins are all there. They put Jesus on the cross. Amen? When he says, forgive, Father, forgive them, you and, you and I are included. Amen? So he kills. He's dead. Drop down. <laughs> all right? And then the lamb is burned on the altar of burnt offering. When, the, when, when this goes up, the Bible says it's a sweet-smelling fragrance because it reminds God of the perfections and the beauties of His Son on the cross. Yet at the same time, God had to turn His back because His Son was carrying all our sins and His eyes are purer eyes than to behold evil. He turned His back on His Son and when Jesus hung on the cross, there was not one ray of light from heaven on Him and there was not one drop of water from the earth to give Him. He took the place of a sinner, the condemned, the one who is accursed, amen, because he took your place and my place. So Jesus, the lamb dies and is burned. What happened to the offer? You and I, what happened? He walks away with the righteousness of the lamb and God's light shines on him. The favor of God is on him. All that the lamb deserves falls on him. All that Jesus deserves comes on him. He is blessed like nobody else as if he's the greatest thing that ever lived. When actually it is all grace. Amen. Thank you very much. Give them a good hand. Thanks, Pastor Henry. This is grace. It is not going higher, do better, try harder. No. It is receiving a finished work. You see, how did Jesus become sin on the cross? Did Jesus do sin to become sin? No. He never sinned. So how do you and I become righteous today? By doing righteousness? No. We receive His righteousness. Just like Jesus became sin on the cross by receiving your sins into His body, by receiving my sins into His body, and He was punished for our sins in our place. Amen. And we, how do we, we become righteous? Not by doing righteous. We receive His righteousness. And then we walk away and God treats us like Jesus. Just like God treats Jesus on the cross like us the sinner that we are. And all this is the love plan of God. Sin is not the problem today. It's a lack of revelation. Amen. You know, when Jesus rose from the dead, the stone was rolled away. It's a very heavy stone. And um, in Israel today, there's a garden tomb you can go to. And I believe it's a genuine garden tomb. Uh, where Jesus left behind the empty tomb. Because the Bible says you have to stoop down. J Peter and John, when they came to the empty tomb, they had to stoop down to see with the place where Jesus laid. And the garden tomb, you have to stoop down to see the place where Jesus laid. And the stone was rolled away not to let Jesus out. It was rolled, because you know why? 
in that new body is a body that's physical. When he appeared in the upper room before his disciples who were, the doors were closed for fear of the Jews and the disciples were all hidden there. And when Jesus appeared in, in, right in the midst, all right, he told them, handle me. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see me have. There's material flesh and bones. So in the glorified body, we have flesh and bones. We're not floating into each other's house. It's, it's flesh and bones, except that you never get tired. You never feel bored again. You can sit through your pastor's sermon. <laughs> Amen. You, you, you'll never fall sick ever again. And you'll never die. You'll never grow old. In fact, the Bible says the angel that the women came, to, when they came to the upper room, they saw the angels. They were all young. They saw a young man sitting on the stone, almost in defiance against the stone that's supposed to keep Jesus in. You know, and the Romans said, they put extra guard outside to make sure, all right, the stone is not rolled away. And the angel came down and rolled the stone away and sat on it. Amen. Not to let Jesus out, but to help others who, who came to the tomb to see in what has happened. Because Jesus' resurrected body transcends this body. You know, our body is not that. The Bible talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15. It says that there are celestial bodies, there are terrestrial bodies, there are bodies made for fishes. You know, you don't have a fish body unless you're Aquaman. <laughs> or Spider-Man. Then you, you got an ironic body, you know. No, no. See, friend, Animal body is one thing, insect body is one thing, another level. But when God made your body, God made your body the highest creation. But then there's a higher creation, the resurrected body of Jesus, that the Bible says one day our bodies will be transformed like His body. And that body doesn't come and go. Jesus, when in, his in His resurrected form, does not come, does not go. He appears or disappears. Therefore, the stone is not needed to be rolled away for Him to come out. He can appear and disappear. He's no more subject to the laws of this earth, like the law of gravity or whatever, or time and matter. He transcends them. Just like an aeroplane, every time an aeroplane takes off, all right, it transcends the law of gravity by the law of trust and lift. There'll be a higher law that we'll all walk in. Jesus' body is a different body than, than the body of Lazarus whom He raised from the dead. Right after that, Lazarus was dead four days, the sister said, you know, by this time he stinks. And Jesus says, if you believe, you'll see the glory of God. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. I'm so glad Jesus says Lazarus. He specified because that, that place got a lot of dead people around. You know, if he says, come forth, everyone could come forth. <laughs> Lazarus came forth bound hand and foot. Because in those days, when you die, the Jewish custom is to wrap you in a linen cloth like a mummy. And then they'll put uh, spices. And when the spices harden, there's no way you can crack open the thing. It's hard as a rock. And that's very interesting because the Bible says when Peter and John came to the empty tomb, the woman, the first person that Jesus appeared to in his resurrected form was a woman. And all the women said, yeah. a new order has come. <laughs> Amen. Under the law, women, in a sense, is subjugated. They're not even recognized. But under grace, a new order has come. The first preacher actually was a woman. Jesus told Mary, go, not Mary, his mother. There are a few Marys in the Bible. This is Mary Magdalene. He said, go and, go, go and tell my brethren. First time he calls them my brethren. Before that, he calls them my flock, my disciples. But this is the first time he says, my brethren. Tell them, tell them I'm going to their father and my father. Your God and my God. We are now from the same family. Once you are born again, you are born with the nature and the stock and the DNA of God Himself. Blessed by what you've seen today? Subscribe to the Joseph Prince Ministries YouTube channel and never miss a single episode. New videos released daily that will encourage and empower you to live a victorious life. 